Science is a profession. And like all professions, it takes many, many years to become a professional. And the skills that are required take many years of practice, even though you receive expert instruction. To those who haven't received that instruction and also haven't practiced, it seems like magic, the sort of things that professionals can do. And it seems effortless. But of course, professionals know that it never ceases to be difficult to do these things. It's just that they've practiced a lot and they work in ways that make the practice safe and successful. Varying effects models are like, well, blowing glass in a way. Uh, they produce beautiful things, wonderful results. They're really essential scientific instruments, but you have to use them in a way that requires some practice and also some safe practice. So this lecture will focus on that. But let me begin by reminding you what varying effects are. In the previous lecture, last week, I introduced you to varying effects through this tadpole survival example. And I'm repeating it here. I hope you remember this figure. And what I showed you, I hope I showed you, is that if we take a model, a uh, sort of ordinary model in which we estimate the survival across a range of different units in the data, we always have this choice of what the prior should be uh, for those parameters that estimate the features of each unit. And uh, in particular, how wide the prior should be. In this example, that's the sigma parameter that determines the standard deviation of the normal distribution assigned to the log odds of survival for each tank. So for very small sigma values, like on the left uh, of the graph on the bottom part of this slide, uh, we call this the complete pooling kind of model. If we just fix sigma to a very small value, that's like assuming that all of the different units in the data, all of the tadpole tanks in this case, are the same. And so if we see data for any one of them, we update our estimates for all of the tanks using that same information because we've assumed they're all the same. And so information about any one tank tells us about all of the tanks. Uh, the population is represented by one number, essentially, the overall mean. This is the complete pooling approach. In the middle, uh, as we increase sigma, the scale variable, we get partial pooling, where there's some mix uh, between information particular to each tank, each unit in the data, and information that comes from the collection of data as the complete pooling kind of solution. And then if we increase sigma far enough off the right hand side of this graph, we reach uh, at infinity, but actually long before that, uh, the no pooling approach where the model has such a wide prior that it effectively um, forgets about every unit in the data, every tadpole tank when it moves to the next one, the amnesia kind of model. Uh, and what I tried to show you is that partial pooling is a really good intermediate solution because it produces better predictions. It seems to automatically locate the values of the sigma parameter, the standard deviation, that perform well in cross-validation. And that's why we use multi-level models, these models that learn the shape of the prior from the sample, uh, because they make better estimates for better predictions and better predictions of causal effects as well. These are great tools, great technologies, uh, great glass blowing devices, um, but they come with them with, uh, they bring with them practical difficulties. And I want to spend this lecture just talking about those practical difficulties. I'm not really introducing you to new model types in this lecture, so you can uh, relax a bit. Um, Instead, we're going to practice uh, what we met last week, and we'll practice it in ways that make it safer and uh, easier to understand. So I want to argue that in general, varying effects models are a really good default kind of regression. There are many, many more research circumstances in which they're appropriate than there are circumstances in which they are not appropriate. And that's because we like regularized estimates. However, uh, there are a lot of puzzling things that 
that uh, most people need to be shown and uh, most people need some time to practice so that they can really responsibly and professionally use multi-level models. The first of these is how do we use more than one cluster type at the same time? So a cluster type is something like a department or a tadpole tank. So in the um, trolley problem data from uh, the start of last week, we had two cluster types, stories and participants, and we'd like them both in the model. How do we do this? The second is how we calculate predictions. And calculating predictions gets more complicated with varying effects models because there's more than one model in the model. There's the uh, model of the observations and there's the model of the groups. And when we generate predictions, we have to decide how we use the separate models uh, because we don't always use them both. And third, there are a number of technical issues with multi-level models and just sampling um, parameter values from their posterior distributions, uh, which are new. And I want to introduce you to those today as well and introduce you simultaneously to solutions to all of these things. OK, a little bit of terminology. Um, we're going to talk about clusters when we talk about multi-level models, and we're going to talk about features. Uh, clusters, I'll also sometimes say units. Uh, these are kinds of groupings in the data, discrete groupings in the data. Um, and features, in contrast, are aspects of the model that vary by cluster, by group. These aspects are often parameters, uh, but sometimes they're not. Um, so the, we've already seen examples of these things, and you can map clusters to their features. In the tadpole example, we had tanks, and the features of the tanks that varied were their survival rates. Uh, there were stories in the trolley problem example, and the features that varied are the treatment effects, which can vary by story. Uh, we have individuals in a number of examples, whether it's the uh, graduate school admissions example or the trolley problem example. There were individual uh, applications and participants. And th uh, these things, uh, individuals vary in their properties that affect uh, what they do in the model, their average responses. And then departments uh, can vary by admission rate uh, and also their bias. So there can be multiple features for each cluster and that they vary in. Today, we're going to be focusing on clusters and not features. So uh, how to add clusters to models and then how to manage the additional complexity that arises from that. And what this means is adding more index variables because every cluster type needs its own index variable and also adding more population priors. And I'm going to show you how to do that in this lecture. Uh, in a future lecture, um, I'm going to show you how to add features. And this means adding more parameters that, that pertain to each cluster. Uh, another way to think about this is you get more dimensions in each population prior. We're not going to get more population priors. There's only one population prior per cluster. Instead, each population prior grows in dimension. Uh, that may not be clear right now. Uh, it doesn't need to be. Uh, you can wait until the next lecture. Okay, let me introduce an empirical example to motivate this. It's always more interesting that way. So here's an experiment that I, I discuss in multiple chapters in the book. It's introduced in the generalized linear model chapter, and then it comes up again a lot in later chapters. So if you're following in the book, you already know this example. I'm going to explain it as if you don't. So what you're looking at here is a camera's eye view of an experiment with chimpanzees. And uh, we have our protagonist in behind this uh, glass window over here, uh, who's the focal actor in the experiment. And uh, that glass window is a barrier, but there are two holes cut into it, one on the left and one on the right. And the chimpanzee can't crawl through them. Chimpanzees are big, but he can, he or she can, uh, put his or her hand through the hole to reach some levers. There's a lever on the left and a lever on the right. And the chimpanzees, uh, these are captive chimpanzees who are used to doing research, and they know all about levers. They're trained on this task. And in this particular task, there's some food on the table. Uh, there, rather, there's some trays on the table, and some of these trays have food in them. You can see the, the tray on the left there has a food object, a little yellow food object and the tray on the right is empty. And the chimpanzees can see this. They're extremely clever. Um, 
And the chimpanzees know that when they pull a lever on a particular side, it will cause the accordion-like device in the middle of the table there, you can see it at the bottom of this picture, uh, to extend and it'll push the tray closer to the window and then the chimpanzee can grab it and get the food item. So what you're looking at here is kind of the controlled or training set uh, just to train the chimpanzee on how the device works. And the chimpanzees um, have no mistakes in pulling the right lever to get the food. They learn this extremely fast. Now here's the real experiment. On the other side of the table, now we're looking at the camera's eye view in the other direction, there's another window, but there are no levers. There's another chimpanzee in some of the conditions, or there, there can be another chimpanzee there, or the window can be empty. Let's call this the partner. And again, there's food laid out in some of the dishes. And in this particular experiment, what we're, what's going to happen in every case is that one side of the table at random will have two food items, um, and the other will have only, uh, only one. And in particular, only one for the partner. So now the question is, uh, if the actor pulls the left lever, and we're going to call this the prosocial option because there are two food items on the left in this, in this example, um, then both the partner and the actor get food. However, if the actor pulls the right lever, then only the actor gets the food. And so the question is, uh, which chimpanzees uh, will tend to pull the prosocial option? It's prosocial because it costs them nothing. The actor always gets food in this experiment. It's just that if they pull the left lever here, the partner also gets food. Uh, I should say that human kids nearly always pull the prosocial option in an experiment like this from a very early age. So we're interested in whether chimpanzees uh, behave similarly prosocially as human children uh, in a very similar kind of task. Um, here's the data set we're going to use. It's in the rethinking package, uh, data chimpanzees. This is 504 trials of the sort I just showed you with seven different actors, that is seven different individual chimpanzees, uh, and six different experimental blocks, which you can think about as days on which trials were run. We care about the blocks because often experimental blocks induce biases and, and treatment effects can vary by block. Uh, so treatments are, are randomized within blocks and um, there are four different treatments. Uh, we have first that the prosocial option can be on the right side of the table from the actor's perspective and there can be no partner at the other end. Uh, the second is that the prosocial option is on the left and there is still no partner and then both right and left again, but with the partner. So we're interested in all four of these treatments because it's not just enough that the chimpanzee pulls the prosocial option. The chimpanzee could be attracted to the fact that there's more food on that side of the table, even though they understand they're only getting one piece of food. Um, what we wanna see is if they pull the prosocial option more often when the partner's on the other side, uh, which would be consistent at least with the idea that they understand they're helping the partner at no cost to themselves. Let's draw a DAG. This is an easy DAG because this is a controlled experiment. The treatments are assigned and randomized and counterbalanced and all those good things. So we have an outcome P in the middle of this DAG is just pulled left. Then there are features of, uh, well, as you say, there are treatments, which are combinations of condition inside those four treatments on the, I've listed on the left of the slide, uh, which influence um, hypothetically whether a chimpanzee pulls the left hand option so uh, it's coded this way. This isn't the only way to code the experiment, but I've coded it this way because it'll turn out to be quite revealing. Uh, but you can think of it as uh, we want to see if when the prosocial option is on the left, the probability that the left lever is pulled is higher. Um, and then also in combination with, with whether the partner is present. Uh, the second influence is the block. There may be um, unmeasured block effects which, which uh, moderate the uh, treatments. And then there are the actors, and there are features of the actors, in particular, their handedness. Chimpanzees have preferred handedness, right or left, just like humans do. Um, and so you need to take this into account as well. This is another um, Bernoulli model because the outcome is a zero one variable, whether they pulled left. So a uh, familiar model structure for you by now, I hope. And we knew, use the conventional logit link and for the linear model here, I'm going to use um, an interaction between treatment and block 
and then add to that an actor effect. Let me explain why I'm doing it this way. So uh, we want both block and actor variation across them to influence the results. And it's, we could just add block as its own effect, just like actor here. But um, that isn't wholly satisfying uh, because the, the idea is that the blocks um, uh, moderate the treatment effects in some way. And so that means we want to look at interactions between them. So I've created a matrix beta uh, in which the uh, rows are the treatments, one, two, three, four, and the columns are the blocks. And so for each treatment, we get an estimate for each block. And we can look at the variation there. And if the treatments don't vary across blocks, that's good. Um, and if the uh, treatments vary within blocks, that tells us something about the treatment effects working. And then the actor effects, these alpha parameters are going to encode handedness on the log odds scale. Uh, you'll see. Okay, we, let's complete the model with some priors. Uh, so it, it'll be good to label all the pieces of this model. So let's start with these first two familiar pieces and just add some labels on the right of the slide. The top line is just the probability of the left lever being pulled. It's the probability of the observable, observable variable P probability of the data. And then the second line is the definition of the log odds of the left lever being pulled, just our generalized linear model. Then we need the population prior, the prior for the actor effects uh, for the alphas. And this is structurally identical to the tadpole example that we did before. Each, each uh, alpha j, where j is the ID number of some actor in the experiment, has a normal distribution with a mean alpha bar which is kind of the mean handedness, if you will, in the chimpanzee population, and some standard deviation sigma sub a. And I've done a sub a here now because we're going to have more than one sigma in this model. So just hang on. And this is a prior for the distribution of handedness in the population. And these are the actor effects. Then we have an analogous prior for the treatment block effects. I'm assigning this prior to every element of the matrix beta. So for uh, a cell in beta J comma K, that is a treatment J and a block K, it has a normal prior with mean zero and a standard deviation sigma sub B for block. Uh, why is the mean zero here? Well, you could put a, a, a bar beta in here, a beta bar in there if you want, uh, but that would be redundant because you can only have one mean in the logit model uh, up there. Uh, it would be over-parameterizing the model. That wouldn't blow up the model. The model would still work. It would just sample less efficiently. I encourage you to try that experiment if you don't believe me. Um, but there's no need to do it. Uh, in a sense, the zero mean is defining the treatment effects as relative to the handedness. Uh, or you could think of it uh, uh, the opposite if you like. It's the same additive model, uh, but you only need one intercept, one alpha bar. Uh, uh, per generalized linear model. And then we need a prior on the sigmas, and I'm going to give them both the same uh, prior distribution, this exponential uh, with a rate of one. These uh, sigmas are often called variance components. You'll hear that a lot and see it in, um, in a lot of books. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in this lecture. <clears throat> okay. One of the things I've snuck in here, which uh, some of you will find odd, is that I'm doing partial pooling on treatment effects, which are almost always treated as fixed effects, which is a term I haven't used. I've avoided using it. A fixed effect could mean different things, but conventionally in biology, for example, um, it means an effect that isn't, has no partial pooling. It has, its, uh, it has a fixed prior without any um, parameters in it itself. But I'm using partial pooling here. So let me spend just a moment justifying that because it may seem unconventional. And sometimes you'll even read that this is a bad choice. And I really disagree. Um, it's very reasonable. Treatments have all the same properties of other things that we do partial pooling on. So first of all, uh, the treatments are not completely different from one another. If you encountered the data from this experiment in order of the treatments, if I sorted the data set so that you saw all the data for treatment one first and treatment two and then treatment three and treatment four, and you fit the model only to treatment one first, your estimate for treatment one would give you an expectation about treatment two. Of course it would. 
uh, because the treatments don't completely alter the chimpanzee behavior. They only influence it. And so if you learn the effect of one treatment, you get an idea of the size of the effects that are possible in other treatments. Uh, the second intuition I can provide you is there are many possible treatments and any particular experiment only uses a few of them. If you're doing psychology, think of it as there are many stimuli. You've only selected one, probably without examining the effectiveness of lots of other stimuli. So there's a population of stimuli you could use. In this experiment, there's a population of different presentations of the task. And all we're learning about is how chimpanzees respond to this particular one. And so treatments vary due to features that we're not modeling. And again, that's like the other kinds of things we've done popular partial pooling on. You can conceive of a, a population in which we have only sampled some number of, of objects from it. Um, and of course, the best reason to use partial pooling as always is because it works, because it results in better estimates, because it regularizes, it uses the data to choose the prior, to learn the prior. And you have to choose a prior, and there's nothing magical about using partial pooling, because you always have to choose a prior. And the fixed prior, um, as I showed you with the cross-validation example at the start of this lecture, uh, repeated from last week's lecture, is that you could choose a fixed prior that gives you the same regularization properties um, as, as the partial pooling kind of model, as the varying effects model, but you'd have to be impossibly clever or do the cross-validation exercise. Better just to use the partial pooling estimator and uh, get better estimates. And this works for treatments as well as it works for things like tanks um, that are not experimentally controlled. So. Uh, try to summarize it this way at the bottom of the slide. If, if you have a set of parameters in a model that are assigned the same prior, whether they're treatments, which is quite common, right? Because you don't want to choose a prior that biases from the beginning, uh, the treatments to be different. Um, so we often assign them the same prior. It's usually going to be better, not always, but usually to learn the prior from the sample. And it, that's because you'll get better regularization. You'll get better estimates, less overfitting, and you'll avoid underfitting as well. Okay, that's my sermon on uh, modeling treatments as varying effects. Uh, here's the model, and uh, the ULAM code here is very similar to the mathematical model definition. I don't think there are any new tricks in this um, model notation. Again, you'll see the matrix uh, for beta, for B there. I've done this before in previous examples. Um, uh, the code that defines the treatment variables may be a bit odd, but if you play around with that, you can confirm for yourself that it defines the treatments one, two, three, four, as I defined them on the previous slides. Okay, you run this model, and it contains a lot of parameters. I'm just showing you the Precy table on the right. You really don't want to stare too hard at this. It'll stare back. Um, for the moment, I, I do want you to notice, though, that some of the parameters don't sample very efficiently. In particular, at the very bottom, sigma b, has a quite low effective sample size, and the R hat is 1.02. Um, if you look at the trank plot, uh, you could look at the trace plot too, but the, I think the trank plot is more revealing in this case. Uh, you'll see that it's uneven. That is, it's much uh, the ranks are much more widely dispersed on the left than the right. And this is a, a telltale sign that the um, chains are not exploring the posterior distribution very efficiently. Uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to summarize the effects from this uh, model in subsequent slides. Um, later on in this, uh, in this lecture, I fixed this model code so it samples more effectively. And so the results I'm about to show you are from that fixed version of the model. So I'm sorry to leave you in suspense about how to do that, but I think it's better that we summarize what we learned from this model uh, first and then get to the technical issues. Um, so. Um, what I'm showing you here are the posterior distributions on the left of the actor effects. Remember, there are seven chimpanzees who participated in this experiment overall, 504 trials. And um, I have them arrayed out on the horizontal axis on the left. And then the vertical axis there is the probability each of them pulls the left lever. And these are the alpha estimates for each individual. And the uh, intervals there are 89% posterior intervals. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of variation. We have 
below the dashed line in the middle are the right-handed individuals, if you will. I don't know if they're actually right-handed, but they behave as if they're slightly right-handed. They prefer the right lever. And then we have our three lefties, uh, especially number two. Number two actually always pulled the left lever in every trial um, that number two participated in. And so the model is quite confident of the handedness preference of actor number two. Uh, and six and seven as well uh, prefer the left levers. Uh, there's a variation in handedness here, and it appears to drive results. That's why there's all this residual variation picked up by the varying effects on actor, the alpha parameters. On the right, you see the treatment effects split up by block. So um, along the horizontal axis, I have the four treatments. Uh, so RN means a prosocial option on the right, and the N means uh, no partner, and then LN means left and no partner, RP means right and partner, and finally LP means left and partner. And then the dots are the posterior means uh, across blocks. And so there are six blocks in the experiment, so there are six points uh, for each treatment. And you'll see that there's not a lot of variation. Okay, there's some variation across blocks, but not a lot. Uh, and also the treatments don't uh, deviate from the mid-zero line very much, meaning the treatments don't have much of an effect in this experiment. Uh, the chimpanzees do slightly tend to pull the, the left more when the prosocial option is on the left. You'll see that that the, the two treatments that start with L, uh, the second and the fourth, are a little bit higher on average than the other two, uh, but it's not much. Uh, handedness is driving nearly all of the variation uh, in this experiment. Let's look at the um, the variance components, as I called them before, we can look at the posterior distributions of the sigma parameters, and I've put those at the bottom of this slide. So on the left in blue is the actor variation, and there's a lot of this. Remember, the, these sigmas are on the log odd scale, just like the other parameters, and so uh, two is a lot of variation on the log odd scale. Uh, remember, when we assigned a prior uh, to uh, an intercept in a uh, binomial or, or logistic model, a standard deviation of 1.5 would cover the whole range from probability of 0 to 1. So actors cover the whole range just with their handedness preferences here. Um, and then on the right in red at the bottom, you see the, the uh, analogous posterior distribution for treatment and block variation. You see this is much smaller. So this is a way that the model picks this up and represents it in the uh, shape of the the population of these effects. <clears throat> okay, something to to note about these variance components is that they don't they don't add together simply to give you the total variation in the data. That's only true for linear models, simple linear regression models. The the variance components are additive. Um, but uh, linear regressions are the only regression models where that works that way. Uh, in general, the variance components inside a GLM um, aren't simply additive, although of course they are on the latent scale, uh, but it's the outcome scale that matters. And the total variation in the outcome variable is not simply a sum of the variance components because it's, it's transformed by the link function, which squishes parts of the distribution on the latent scale, to, uh, right? There are ceiling and floor effects. Um, and so variation in the consequence of this, and what you want to keep in mind is that variation in one component, like treatment or block, will moderate variation in the others, like handedness and vice versa. This is just like all of the predictors inside a GLM are like this. You've, this is not the first time I've mentioned this. In a generalized linear model, all of the predictors moderate all the others, even if you don't explicitly model them as interactions. And that's because of ceiling and floor effects. Or as I've said, you can only kill the salamander once. If any, if any one thing is, is dangerous enough to kill a salamander, it doesn't matter how many other dangerous things there are. It only takes one of them. And in that sense, the lethality of a predator depends upon things like ambient temperature. Okay. Um, all of this uh, also means that when we compute predictions from varying effects models, we have to do all the same stuff that we dealt with before, and that is marginalize over some target population, some sample that we have in mind for the causal effects. And this is because of these moderation effects, as I've mentioned before. Um, but that's okay, we know how to do this, we just use simulations. With varying effects, though, you have to make a choice first about how you're going to structure your simulation. 
And that's because there are two models inside the model. Uh, and so imagine, for example, that you were going to make predictions of some intervention for the same groups that were in your sample, for the same chimpanzees or the same tadpole tanks or the same UC Berkeley departments. Um, in that case, you could use the posterior distributions of the varying effects estimates themselves, the ones that correspond to each unit in your data, because you're imagining intervening on the same sample, the same population. Uh, but often that isn't what we have in mind, uh, especially in the case of an experiment uh, where we want to generalize the experiment beyond the units in the experiment itself. That's nearly always the case. And in that case, what we want to do instead is use the posterior distribution of the population of groups that we've estimated. And that means the sigmas become much more important. And the particular alpha j's we've estimated are discarded. And we do not use them. Uh, so we ignore the varying effects estimates when we predict for new groups, and that includes predicting interventions or causal effects. Uh, and we do that to marginalize over the population distribution. Now, a word of caution about this is that uh, we've assumed that the population distribution is normal, is Gaussian. And I've said before that that's just a prior distribution. It isn't a claim about the actual shape of the effects in nature. And that's still true. So when you do these simulations, you might want to reconsider that again and think about uh, what you think uh, the shape of the distribution is and whether you're happy with it being Gaussian in these simulations. Uh, because it may not be symmetrical, and you may learn after you fit the model to your sample that the, the variation around the population mean across the four of the units is not symmetrical, or that it has thick tails. And in those cases, it'd be a very good idea to revisit the Gaussian assumption on the varying effects before you simulate interventions. Okay, let me give you an example, and then we'll take a break. Um, Here's an example of simulating intervention for new groups of reed frogs. Uh, and I hope you care about these reed frogs. They're adorable and we want them to survive. So let's imagine an intervention. We, we um, use the data from the experiment and uh, we train a model on it. I show the model on the right. And this is a model that considers both the variation across tanks. Those are the A parameters in the varying effect model uh, on the right. This is just like the previous lecture. And then I have a B matrix, a beta matrix there, that considers all the interactions between the presence of predators P and the size of the tadpoles G, uh, small or large. So there's four parameters in the B matrix. Um, and then we estimate, we train the model on the sample. And now I'm going to compute an intervention for you, imagining a target population that's, uh, in which 50% of the groups are exposed to predators. Um, and 25% of the groups have large tadpoles. And we're going to imagine an intervention where on this, we go to this target population and we say nutritionally augment uh, some of the groups such that the result is that 75% of the groups uh, are large now, not just 25%. What is the causal effect of this according to the experiment? What's the, ex the distribution of expected causal effects across groups? And we're going to do this through simulation. Here's the simulation code. I'm going to step through this for you so you understand how to draw the owl. Remember the owl? Uh, the owl is still here and we want to draw it. Um, the very top of the code is just extracting the samples from the, uh, from the chains, putting in an object post. Then I define how many groups I'm going to simulate, a thousand, and there are two thousand samples total from all the chains and I'm going to use them all. Then I make an empty matrix, S1, which is just going to hold all these groups and all the simulations for each sample. And then I loop over the groups, uh, S. And the first thing I do inside the loop is sample from the population distribution of tanks. And that's what I'm doing there. So you see it's R norm. Uh, and I'm using the posterior distribution of sigma in this line to simulate this. And then next, uh, I sample uh, uh, a value of the predator presence, one or two, and the size of the individual's G. And I'm using the probabilities uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 for predators because that's what the example assumes, 50% predation at the group level. And then uh, it's a 25% chance that the group is large. And then finally, we just use our GLM. Uh, we do the inverse logit on these parameters uh, and data that we've, um, uh, that we've simulated. And then we generate um, a binomial 
uh, result, random binomial result for each of the probabilities we've simulated for a group of size 35. And they don't have to be large groups like this, they could be smaller, but I want to show you that the density will affect how many survive, of course. Even though I haven't modeled the effects of density in this, um, it's going to affect the counts and that'll affect the variation, right? Larger groups can have more variation, to more total variation on the outcome scale. So for this, uh, which I call the status quo simulation, because we're simulating uh, what the target population is supposed to look like now, the model expects this distribution of survivorship on the right all the way from zero. Very, you know, there'll be a very small number of groups where almost all the tadpoles die. Um, but in uh, for most case, most of them survive. Uh, but there's a very wide range of results. We do a very similar simulation for the intervention, and now what we change is the distribution of sizes. It's just the G line that changes here. And you can see that um, we made them bigger now. We flipped the, the 75 and the 25 in that line, and then we get a different frequency distribution of results. You'll see uh, where there's this um, second uh, mode on the left there, peaks around uh, 15, and that's a result of the fact that uh, large groups, uh, large tadpoles suffer more from predation than small ones do, according to the model. <clears throat> and if we look at the difference between these things, we want to take the difference because uh, different groups experience different results of the intervention. And so we want to do this comparison group by group and look at the resulting distribution of differences after matching the groups. And uh, that's what we've done here. And uh, you can see that uh, on average, there's um, uh, the mean is a little bit below zero, so the average causal effect here is quite small. It's just a slightly hurts the population to, to actually make them bigger. Um, uh, but you'll see that it's not symmetric, and so there's some risk involved here that we may also want to consider because uh, the variance goes up from this. Okay, using that kind of technique, that kind of simulation technique, you can simulate well, anything you want from any model, as long as you understand the generative model. Uh, and uh, uh, the group variation in these things, of course, the, the varying effects, it, they, that moderates the causal effects. And so one of the things that's happening here is there's a lot of group variation according to the model. And that pushes the log odds of survival up against the ceiling quite a lot uh, in this. It, it creates additional variation, which makes the other causes like predation or, or tadpole size matter less. And that's what I mean by moderation. Um, when you average over the group variation by simulating it, uh, then you can account for that effect um, in your predicted interventions. So you have to know the generative model, but that, and that's one of the reasons from the beginning of this course I've emphasized that when we draw the owl, we think about the generative approach first, whether it's just a heuristic thing like a DAG or it's something more detailed like a, a full simulation, a synthetic data simulation, uh, like we did a lot in the first half of the course. Uh, we need those same techniques to simulate the, co the causal effects that come from complicated models like this. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, you've earned it. Uh, when you come back, we're going to talk about some more technical issues with these um, uh, varying effects models. Uh, but before you do that, I really encourage you to look over the preceding slides, um, take some notes, uh, and make sure you're ready to continue. And when you are, I will be here. Welcome back. Let's pick up with some interesting technical issues with varying effects models. What I'm showing you on the screen here is a simple joint distribution between two priors. There's no data involved here. One variable V which has a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one half, and another X, which has a normal distribution of zero, and its standard deviation is the exponentiated values of V, sample term distribution. And then the uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulation on the left is running around the skate park, as it was uh, sampling from this distribution quite efficiently. What I want you to see is that the shape of X, the distribution X, creates this kind of funnel at the bottom. That is, for small values of V, 
x is a very narrow normal distribution and that's why the distribution contracts in a kind of funnel uh, towards the bottom. Uh, but this doesn't cause a problem for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It handles the curvature just fine. But what happens when we make the standard deviation of v larger? Now something uh, very unfortunate happens actually. The funnel gets very, very deep and uh, very narrow. So I'm showing you in this animation uh, as we change the standard deviation of the variable v, that is the uh, vertical axis variable, the high density region of this uh, joint distribution gets sucked down into this funnel. Uh, this is an example in, uh, in the book that I call the devil's funnel. That's an example I learned from Radford Neal. And uh, uh, it illustrates, it's a simple example, perhaps the simplest, that illustrates one of the challenges in sampling from posterior distributions of varying effects models. Why? Because varying effects models have joint distributions that look like the one on this slide. That is, they have distributions which are conditional on other distributions. And in particular, their scale variables, their standard deviations, are parameters which are dependent on other distributions. And that creates this sucking effect that you see on the slide here if those, if those uh, scale variables um, get large enough. So now let's run HMC uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on this uh, version uh, of the funnel and you'll see some uh, weird paths arise. Uh, each of these red dots is a divergent transition. That's a rejected proposal from the Markov chain. And to remind you, uh, rejected proposals uh, don't mean that anything's necessarily broken, but it's just that the whole reason we're using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is we want all the proposals, or as many as possible, to be accepted. That the problem with other versions of, of Markov chain Monte Carlo are that they make very inefficient proposals. Many or most of them are rejected, and that wastes a lot of computing time. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo thinks much harder about which proposals to offer. It runs a physics simulation, uh, but that allows it to make good proposals. But here's a very simple joint distribution where Hamiltonian Monte Carlo has a lot of trouble. You'll see as it wanders down into the funnel, and it will because that's where the mass is, the probability mass, um, it has a lot of trouble sampling and it ends up breaking. What's going on here? Well, the basic problem is that the distribution is very curved in that area, very narrow and curved. And that's what generates these divergent transitions, which are the result of broken simulations where the approximation we're using for the curvature uh, is not accurate enough. And the uh, algorithm luckily detects that, but this makes proposals inefficient. So. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you'll recall, uses a bunch of piecewise linear approximations of the, of the actual curved posterior distribution. And it does so in uh, the, the length of those linear segments is called the step size. And the step size is constant. Uh, and if the curvature varies a lot in different regions of the posterior distribution, as it does in the example here, uh, the curvature, it's very narrow in that uh, funnel at the bottom, and it's very flat and low curvature at the upper part of the plot. Um, that means that the same step size is not going to be optimal everywhere, or even good, forget optimal. Uh, and therefore, uh, if it gets into a region of very high curvature, like the funnel, um, the simulation simply cannot follow the surface. It can't turn fast enough. So there are a couple things we can do. Uh, the first is we can use a smaller step size. That'll create a more accurate simulation. And the second is to reparameterize. I want to talk about each of these. So the setting a smaller set step size is something that um, an engine like Stan is going to do for you automatically. It's going to try to figure out the best step size for the posterior distribution during the warm-up phase. And so if it ends up selecting a small step size, it'll be able to explore uh, these narrow funnels, like the one here, you'll see that we're not getting nearly as many divergent transitions. The side effect, though, that's unfortunate is that it's going to explore the posterior distribution much more slowly. Uh, and so there's 
no free lunch. There's always a trade-off here. Smaller step sizes are inefficient in their own way, even though they avoid the divergent transitions. So is there something else we can do? Or in addition, I should say, because you can do both of these things together. And the answer is luckily yes. In many cases, um, there's a clever trick, which is much, much better than simply setting a very small step size. And that is to reparameterize. So let me explain uh, what that means. So here's the um, joint distribution that I've used in the in the preceding slides for the Hamiltonian animations. Uh, just two variables, uh, the first with a normal distribution with a standard deviation of three, and the second with a normal distribution where its standard deviation is the exponentiated values of the first. This is called a centered uh, distribution because uh, one or more of the uh, distributional statements has a parameter inside of it. So the distribution for x is a normal distribution and it can, it's a function of v. We can, in many cases, uh, take the parameters out of those distributions and specify an equivalent joint distribution, but it's going to look different. And this is called the non-centered version. Uh, and that's what I'm showing you on the right. Uh, and you see what I've done is I've um, created a new variable z. This is a new random variable and it has a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. It's just a z-score distribution, standardized normal. And now I've defined x not as a random variable, but just as a, a deterministic function of the values of z and v. Uh, that is, it z times the exponentiated value of v. This is equivalent. The distribution of x as defined on the left and the distribution of x as defined on the right are identical. They look quite different. We can do this uh, because we can always divide a normal distribution by its standard deviation, making it standardized, and then we can put it back on the non-standardized scale by multiplying it by the original standard deviation. And that's all we've done here. I've defined z as the z-scores of x, and then I put x back on its normal scale by multiplying those z-scores by the standard deviation, which, which is the exponentiated values of v. So these are equivalent, but it turns out in this case that the distribution on the right, even though it's the same distribution, is going to sample much more efficiently because we are going to draw values from the joint distribution of v and z rather than the joint distribution of v and x. And that's going to be much nicer because it's going to be a Gaussian bowl. And the Gaussian bowl is the best place to skate. So here I'm showing you for two chains simultaneously, just to show off a bit, uh, uh, sampling, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling from a two-dimensional Gaussian bowl. This is what it's born to do. Uh, this is its vibe. It's very, very good at this. Um, very, very uh, low number of rejected proposals. Almost every proposal is accepted. High efficiency, good exploration of the space. Um, we get this through re this reparameterization trick from moving from a centered version where there are um, some variables which are, their distributions are functions of other variables to factoring all of the parameters out of the distributions and making some formulas to reestablish the original distribution. And that's called the non-centering trick. Let me show you this trick in the context uh, of running the actual stand chains. Um, and that might help you understand it a little better. So I'm just taking this funnel example. Remember, I call this the devil's funnel in the textbook. <clears throat> and I can express it as a stand model. Uh, so um, this, this is in chapter 13. We have model 13.7 and 13.7 NC for non-centered. And uh, these are the simplest stand models you could write. They just have the... They're just prior distributions. There's no data here, but that's fine. We can use stand to sample from priors. And you can run these two models. They're not gonna take long to run. Uh, what I want you to see about the second one though is that little GQ line, the third line in the formula list of the non-centered version where I'm reconstructing X uh, through the deterministic function of Z times the, the standard deviation that we want. That is the exponentiated values of V. Um, if you run these models, the first one gives you uh, uh, a number of divergent transitions. Uh, I got 112 out of 2,000 on uh, this particular run. You should try it for yourself. That number will vary depending upon where it explores. 
And you can see from the diagnostics in the Precy output that th these chains are not in good shape. They're not returning uh, reliable estimates. They're not exploring the posterior distribution efficiently. And if we ran them a very long time, we would probably get a good picture of it. Uh, but there's another trick, and that is simply to use the other model, the non-centered version, which you can see from the Precy output on the bottom half of the slide is very efficient. Uh, the diagnostics are good and we're getting the right answer. If you look at the trace plots, you can see uh, uh, the problem. This is the trace plot for the centered version, the version that doesn't sample well, the centered version of the Devil's Funnel. These are not healthy trace plots. I'm sure you can see at a glance. They're not exploring the same space. <clears throat> and then here's the trace plot uh, for the centered version. These are the hairy caterpillars um, you want. And I'm also showing you the trace for the reconstructed X. And you'll see those spikes. Uh, that's fine. That's what the distribution of X looks like. It's got those spikes because of the existence of the funnel and it needs to explore it. Yeah, and so that's, that's fine. You'll see that the uh, effective sample sizes, the NF values are good. Okay. That's a made up example though, right? That's not a real data analysis example. The, the devil's funnel example is there as this little um, um, memory nugget, uh, if I can invent a term, that to help you see the quintessential form of the reparameterization of a varying effect. It'll be good though to take that quintessential form and stick it in a real data analysis example. So I'm gonna do that now uh, for the reed frogs uh, that we met uh, in a previous lecture. <clears throat> uh, to remind you, um, we had fit varying effects across the uh, tanks of tadpoles. Uh, I repeat the model on the slide here. These alpha uh, parameters, alpha sub tank or alpha sub j as it is, as it is expressed in the prior, are the log odds uh, rate of survival in each tank. And this is a centered version of the model. I didn't call it that at the time, but it is. And you can see that because um, there are parameters, alpha bar and sigma, in the prior for alpha j, and that's what makes it centered. It's got parameters to determine where it is, to determine its location and its shape. Here's the equivalent non-centered version of this model. These models are completely equivalent from a mathematical perspective, but once you run them in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, they are not because they imply different posterior geometries that you need to skate around, different skate parks with different shapes. And that's the non-centering trick that I showed previously. So what I've done, I'll, I'll walk you through it piece by piece. Um, first, we replace the alpha sub t's in the logit line with this weird term, which is the mean alpha bar plus the z-score, z sub tank, there's now a z-score that's specific to each tank, times the standard deviation. Remember, we do this to get back to the original alpha j's. That's just the definition of alpha j. It's the mean plus the z-score times the standard deviation. And then, uh, oops, sorry, uh, and then notice I've added um, in, uh, z sub j as a normal 0, 1 to the model on the right. Uh, so that's the distribution we need to sample from, the z-scores, and it has nice curvature uh, because it doesn't have sigma inside of it. Okay, uh, that's not the example we want to work with, though. Um, let's revisit the chimpanzees from the first half of this lecture and think about that model again. And that model was centered, uh, just to repeat it here. Uh, and the non-centered version, analogously, now has two effects. So we need two distributions of z-scores, and we're going to use them both. This is a complicated model, uh, but it's the same as the first. Let me just show you the, the, the corresponding pieces of the two models for the um, handedness parameters for each chimpanzee, for the alphas uh, the, uh, on the right, the, the non-centered model, they appear again as this sum of a mean alpha bar plus the z-scores times the standard deviation that corresponds to that cluster type, that is the individual chimpanzees. Um, and I've also added, of course, the, the standard normal zero one prior for the z sub alphas comma j. Uh, and then the uh, treatment block effects. Uh, remember I had done an interaction of treatment with block to look for, for block effects. Um, 
and uh, I've replaced this in the non-centered version again with this product of the z-scores um, from the matrix. Now we have a matrix of z-scores uh, for treatment and block times the standard deviation of those values, which we're going to learn from the data. Where we had a fixed prior, um, uh, we could have had a fixed prior here, but we we um, do partial pooling on the treatments because we assign the same prior. We'd rather just learn the prior from the data rather than choose it arbitrarily. These models are equivalent, uh, but they run quite differently in the machine. Here's the uh, Ulam code for both of these models. The model at the top on the left is the code you saw in the first half of the lecture. The model on the bottom is the non-centered version, and it's messier. Yes, it is. You'll see the z-scores in the logit line, and you'll see that the um, uh, instead of uh, A and B being defined in the priors, we have the z-scores for them defined in the priors. And then at the uh, very bottom of the model, I've used this GQ trick again. GQ stands for generated quantities to simply compute the alpha and beta values so that they're saved in the posterior and we can uh, interpret them much more easily later. Because who wants to interpret z-scores? You'd have to do all this multiplication after the fact otherwise, which you could always do. You could uh, ignore the GQ lines run this model, and then post-process the posterior distribution and compute the alphas and betas using these definitions. Uh, but it's more convenient just to add uh, lines like these, these little GQ lines at the bottom. Uh, let me walk you through this, uh, say it all again, uh, and, and highlight the bits in the math model on the right that correspond to the code. We've added a bar now to the generalized linear model, to the linear model com component. It's not in the prior anymore and it's added to the z-scores for the actors times their standard deviation, and the same uh, for the treatment block effects. We've got z-scores times uh, their standard deviation. There's no mean, recall, for the um, treatment and block effects because uh, we only need one mean. We only can have one mean for a generalized linear model, and alpha bar takes care of that. And then the GQ uh, lines that I mentioned before. That just simply, this is a convenience, it's not required. Okay, let's look at those effects. Uh, so I'm showing you here the uh, trank plots, that is the trace rank plots uh, for the new model, and these uh, are much better, uh, much more even along, um, and much more switching and better effective sample sizes for the parameters. And on the right, I'm showing you the direct comparison of the two models. Um, the horizontal axis are the effective sample sizes of parameters for the centered version, and uh, the vertical is the effective sample sizes of the same parameters for the non-centered version. Each point is a parameter. And uh, where they're colored blue, they're above the diagonal. That means the non-centered version has a larger number, of, uh, a larger effective sample size, and where they're colored red, it's lower. So it isn't that the non-centering trick always helps. There are some combinations of models and parameters and data for which centering is better. And there are other combinations for which non-centering is better. Uh, and uh, it depends upon whether the prior or the, or the data are more important in determining the shape of the posterior. Well, that's one of the things that matters. Um, and uh, that affects whether you get these narrow regions that are hard to sample from. Uh, so sometimes you need to switch uh, from a non-centered to a center, centered for some um, cluster types and then switch from centered to non-centered for others. So you need to be flexible in this and not the lesson here is not that non-centered distributions are always better. It's that reparameterizing between the options is uh, a technique that you want. It's a very good glass blowing technique to use the metaphor from the start of the lecture. With some practice, um, you can do it very quickly because uh, it looks complicated at first, all that Z times Sigma stuff, uh, but eventually it becomes second nature and you'll be doing it um, all the time with your varying effects models and they'll run much faster. You won't have to wait as long and the results will be more reliable and that'll make you more comfortable and it'll make your colleagues more comfortable as well. So uh, to wrap up here, I'd, Technologies like varying effects models are essentially indispensable now. Uh, they've become a standard part of the scientific toolkit, uh, but they take some time to master. You have to be patient, you need instruction, and you need, most of all, practice. 
Uh, and in, as you practice, you want to practice safely and you want to practice working safe and you want to practice working responsibly. And uh, so I've tried to teach you these little techniques um, as part of that mission. Uh, so what we covered today was the use of more than one cluster type and how to specify that, uh, uh, how to calculate predictions from varying effects models because there are more choices to make now uh, due to the fact that there are multiple models inside the model. And uh, third, how to sample chains efficiently for varying effect models. We get much more complicated shapes of the posterior distribution for these models as a direct consequence of the fact that prior distributions have other distributions embedded in them. There are functions of distributions now, and that can result in things like the devil's funnel, uh, but we have, we have techniques for solving this problem so we can move forward and work on the scientific models we want to work on rather than let purely statistical considerations uh, decide which models we use. Okay, that was lecture 13, uh, which covers mostly material in chapter 13 of the book. Uh, the next lecture this week, we're going to look at um, varying slopes, uh, which is the other aspect of expanding multi-level models where we consider more than one feature of each cluster type uh, in the model. Uh, I'll see you there.